get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, Ryan, what I love talking about is the challenge stories. Not, you know, there's success, tons of success stories, but I love hearing the challenge stories. I interviewed Moise Navone of Mobileye, and he talked about Mobileye's journey of being acquired for $15.2 billion by Intel. But what I loved about the story is he had to go home at one point to his wife and kids and tell them, listen, I'm pulling you out of all extracurriculars. We cannot, no niceties. We can't go eat out anymore because uh, I got, you know, the the pay is cut. Like I need to trim back, you know, and there were many cuts before they actually sold the company. And and also, you know, when I had uh, Tony Horton on a P90X, he talked about he made money as a street mime. Okay. He put his head on the street and did street miming to make his food and rent money before obviously we know they, he sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X. And by the way, I'm going to introduce today's guest in a second, Ryan Moran. Uh, you need to check out his book, 12 Months to $1 Million. And um, I'll, I'll give you more details on that in a second. But he talks about some of the past guests I've had, RX Bars, Quest Nutrition. And he'll go and he gets tactical uh, with it too. So before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 um, relationships by helping you run your podcast. And, you know, Ryan, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships. And a podcast is a way. And I know Ryan has an amazing podcast, by the way, capitalism.com. Um, check it out as well. So he he knows the power of, and I was listening to one the other day, Ryan, of you. And it's like for personal development too. You're like, I want to learn how to do viral ads. So what do you do? You have the foremost expert on your podcast of talking about ads, right? And it's amazing. It's great for your audience. It's great for you. It's great for everyone. So check out rise25.com. And with no further ado, um, uh, we have Ryan Daniel Moran, founder of capitalism.com. Ryan runs capitalism.com. Basically, he brings like-minded entrepreneurs and experts in the e-commerce space, more than the e-commerce space, all spaces together to build brands and businesses that last. He launched Amazon businesses that he eventually sold for over eight figures. And he's got an amazing podcast, capitalism.com, where you know he helps entrepreneurs at every stage of business. And he wrote the book, 12 Months to $1 Million, How to Pick a Winning Product, Build a Real Business, and Become a Seven-Figure Future Entrepreneur. What I admire most about Ryan is he surrounds himself with amazing people. And if you look at his Capcom conferences, which hopefully that comes back whenever you're listening to this, he's <laughs> had some of the smartest people in the world speak. Um, Damon John, Robert Hershevac, Michael Dubin of Dollar Shave Club, and many more. Um, we met actually at, uh, well, we talked before that, but we were sitting next to each other at dinner at Mastermind Talks, uh, right. Jason Gaynor's Mastermind Talks. I was cleaning up my hard drive and I saw a video and we were just sitting there uh, together. So Ryan, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, good to see you, man. Thank you for having me. The other thing I love about you is your vulnerability. And I don't know if this is, you know, throughout the years, um, but in your book, you talk about selling your business and you talk about the great things, but you also share some of the things going on in your life at the time. So mm -hmm. I figured maybe we start there, like talk about that time, like, which is the pinnacle, it's supposed to be the pinnacle and the supposed ultimate, be, yeah. right? T walk, just tell people in, first of all, check out the book. He talks all about it there, but walk, tell people about that time. Well, I think the story that you're referencing is the day that I sold, I, I've, I've sold a few businesses, but the, the one that was responsible for 70% of my wealth was a, a business that I sold for, for an evaluation of about $15 million and we sold 70-ish percent of it. So it was an eight-figure exit. And it had been a six month process of going through the exit and man, did I make a lot of mistakes and we can talk about those for sure. But my, my business partner calls and he's like, Hey, did you see it? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, it's in there. It's like the wire, the money, the money, <laughs> the money made it. Are you serious? Like it's in there and this big celebration. And then I went, walked back to my apartment and, uh, and it was an empty apartment because I was going through a separation. 
And at that time, I, I spent the next two weeks of my life wealthier than I have ever been, but sleeping on a twin pullout in my empty apartment with no furniture. Um, like, you know, eating, eating bachelor cereal out of the one bowl that I kept with the, the spoon, you know, my, and, and I described it there at that time I was so broke that all I had was money. So I had all, I had all this, this money in the account, um, with an empty apartment and it was very poetic at the time. Uh, so, so it was not all roses at all. And it still isn't right. It, it still isn't. I think we, we so are quick to edify other people's successes and miss all of the good stuff that's happening in our life. I did a video once, my most viral video that I ever made was I was talking about how when I was a kid, all I wanted to be was a millionaire. And now that I'm a millionaire, all I want to be is a care for a kid. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a time that I lost a lot of weight and I had abs for the first time in my life. And I, but then I felt too skinny. You know, and then so I bulked up, and when I bulked <laughs> up, all I all I all I thought oh, about was gosh. how I missed my abs. Mm -hmm. And I realized this once when, after I had my exit, I was driving by the neighborhood where I used to live. Yeah, you know, I had moved to the nice neighborhood, and I drove past that neighborhood where I used to live, and I had this like longing to be there. It was like, oh man, I miss this and this and this and this and this. Jeremy, I hated that house. Like I hated that house when I lived in it. I I didn't like us. I I didn't like it at all. Right? I couldn't wait to move out of there. And then I drove past and I was like, oh, I missed I missed that house that. I, what? And it's just we we have this sense of missing the things that are good right now, and we only pay attention to them mo for the most part in this sense of longing in the rearview mirror. And in the present, we're focused on our problems. And this is kind of the the beauty and the irony of being a human being. And so my vulnerability is often my own wrestling with my desire to be more happy in the present mm -hmm. while also being wired to look at problems in the present and longing for things that are in the future or in the rearview mirror. And you can have that big pinnacle of success, like having an exit, but you are still a human being, which means that you go home and you see your problems. Why did you share that? I mean, in the book, because you didn't need to for someone to execute on, you gave some really tactical advice in the book. I mean, a lot of books either go very tactical, very high level. I, I felt you did a really good job at both of them. Why did you share that story at the end? If I think the, the game that we're all playing is becoming more and more of who we naturally are like that, like what that is, what freedom is, it's the desire for have all limits removed so that you can be yourself, pursue the things that you want to pursue, enjoy the things that you want to pursue. And what I learned through that process was you take yourself wherever you go. So you better enjoy who you are now rather than put it on pause and then go make the money to be able to liberate it. Because all you've done at that point is you've wasted time. Yeah. And what I have discovered is, is you can, you can be who you are. You can enjoy the process now in motion towards those things that you genuinely want. And then they become much more effortless in those pursuits. And so that, that is, that was my message to myself after going down this route and then coming back and reporting on what I had learned and still have to learn because that 23, 24, 25 year old kid, I wish I'd gotten that message or learned that lesson. And so that was me embarking that message onto the people who are starting their journey. You mentioned Ryan mistakes with selling the business. So many, you know, from an outside perspective, it looks like it went amazing, right? <laughs> You well, laugh, I, but go well, ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, you allude to this in the book. Actually, you talk about it. You almost, you briefly mention a couple things, and I'm like, he needs to talk more about. Like, yeah. there needs to be another book about this. I could tell you couldn't flush it out because that wasn't the purpose of the well, book. Yeah, but... it was. It was still in process. So, like, right when the book went to the printer, the company that I sold declared bankruptcy. So it was, and and what happened there is basically I sold my dog to a bad home. And it got abused. Terrible. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's, yeah, it's depressed. And I mean, they still owe, they still owe you money. 
and you still have own equity in the business, but you have no say anymore. Yeah. I felt there was and another just, book in there, like waiting to come out. There, there, yeah. there could have been. Yeah. You have to publish at some point, right? Yeah. Now, I mean, like boo hoo, I got my money, right? I, like boo hoo, I got at least some of what was owed to me. Boo hoo, I learned a lot of lessons, and I'm a better man for this process. Like, what the hell do I have to complain about? But if I could do it again, of course there were mistakes. I think I think this is the biggest lesson from everything, Jeremy, which is we all have this vision. Like, people really want the pot of gold at the end of the, the exit, the big thing of money. What they don't realize is how valuable great businesses are. I mean, the game is not when you go sell. The game is building a great asset. The, uh, Gary Keller says you should never sell a good business. Now, of course, there's life and there's wanting to de-risk things and there's all of this, but the game is in the building of something great, not in the payday at the end of it. When you when you cash in your chips, you're done. You know, then 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 what? Then then you start over, right? And that was a much bigger adjustment than I expected of on the other side of the exit, filling in that space. Because the way that what I did was I took like two weeks where I read books. And then be, was went right back into workaholism. That muscle was well trained at that point. What are you working on? Nothing important. <laughs> so there is the, the game is in building the great asset, and the asset that is the greatest is the one that creates meaningful change in the world. And so the faster that you can learn that lesson, which I had to, you know, I learned by making mistakes, and boy did I ever! Right, I run into walls and say that hurt. I'm not going to do that anymore. And then you come back and you adjust. And eventually you just learn that you're playing a big game. You play the game that you want to play. You can be who you want in the game. And you're creating whatever change is meaningful to you. So, Ryan, talk a little bit about a few of the mistakes. If you were to go back, you may have done things differently. And I I don't ask to make you feel bad or anything. But because, like, someone's going to be selling their business. They're maybe watching this or thinking of selling their business. And a shout-out to... Paul Miller, who's actually in your book, and Kelly yeah. Fidio, who yeah. they have a podcast, Amazing Exit. So um, shout out to both of them. But, um, you know, what are some of the mistakes people are, who are look, going to be selling their business at some point? What should they avoid? You know, th- this, is, this is the biggest thing. If you can realize that you're the hot girl at the dance, if you can realize that the person with the money needs you more than you need them. If you realize that you're the one with the asset that money wants, if you realize that there are equity groups and investors who are waking up in the morning saying, I wish there was a good company to buy, you realize that you're the one with all the cards. So I wish that I had gone into into my, uh, my negotiations not looking for LOIs, which is what, you know, the person who is helping us sell the business was going uh, going in, collecting LOIs. I wish that I had had a term sheet, not waited for one, said, these are my terms. Can you meet these terms? And if they say no, okay, great. That's fine. We're happy keeping the business. Carry on. Move along. Because what we did, this is, uh, oh, Ryan in the past, if you're hearing this, please don't do this. What we did is we went up, we have this great business, you have $3 million in in EBITDA, going out, looking for offers. And when you take the offers, you go under an exclusive LOI, and now you're in the dating period. You don't even know if you like that person. And and I had a sense of the person who bought our business, like, I don't know that I want to do business with this person, but they have an offer on the table and we have to decide if we're going to go through the process or not. And then five months of due diligence, are you going to say no to the check because you don't like the guy? Because now you really hate your life because you're running the business and you're doing due diligence in this process. And there's a carrot at the end of the of the stick. But had I gone into the original negotiations with, these are my terms. One of these terms is you will be a cool human being. One of these terms is that this is my price. And my terms are that I will work this much and this is what I will not. Now I'm in the position. And if they say, I can't work with this guy, great. I'm so glad we got that out of the way now. We'll move on down the line. I I would have probably doubled my valuation had I done this. And, and the business would be a $50 million a year company now instead of bankrupt. So these are just the things that, you know, a, 
a 28, 29 year old entrepreneur who's never done this before goes through that you can avoid if you learn from somebody like me. And I would, I would, the other thing I would say is like, get real help. Uh, now, unfortunately for me, I kind of, um, I kind of started the market of people who were selling specifically e-commerce businesses that took a lot of sales on Amazon. We like, we kind of set the market and made that cool. People were not selling their businesses before then. And what happened with us was that there was really no precedent for this. So, um, uh, M and a companies were not in this yet. And so we went with a broker, which is like, you know, the 2009 version. So I wish we had waited to get real help and gone out and got a, like people who had sold companies for the valuations that we wanted before. Cause we just, we had podunk help. You know, I want to talk about the beginning, you know, you talk about in the book, um, really some strategic and tactical things. And in the beginning you had, you know, in, in your Amazon business, you had three businesses you've talked about hmm. and it kind of, you separate them into, I don't know, your words, not mine, you know, home run, double strikeout. Right. And I think it's an important lesson learned. Like you didn't just have necessarily one thing that was like right. home run out of the gate. So talk about why, um, that was, and, and maybe differentiate those three. Yeah, I mean, there's what I lay out in the book is a very clear process, but that process still has to be married to a good business and to an and to a good entrepreneur and to a good market. And when I started doing e-commerce businesses in 2014, 13 or 14, I kind of went wide and I had a couple partners and I said, I have an idea for this, an idea for this, an idea for this. And all of them were probably equally good ideas. One of them, I had a partner that we were, we were just were rocket fuel when we worked together and we were both committed to the process. Um, one new entrepreneur, smart guy, we had a double one, one partner, you know, probably wasn't the best business idea. We were in it for the money on that one. It was also his first business. We had never worked together before. That one was a strikeout. And so, it th there are all of these different factors beyond just the process, the idea, the product. And for me, it was all of those things and timing and partners. I also started three businesses at once. When is that a good idea? <laughs> you can really only commit to one. You're just trying to be like Elon Musk. It's fine. <laughs> well, Elon did one thing really well before yeah. he, be yes. before he uh, went wide. And uh, for me, you know, one of those things got all my attention and one of those things you know, made me a multimillionaire. Yeah. I think, Ryan, one of the things you talk about, which I, again, I, I need a constant reminder of, a slap in the head with, um, is market to a person. And yes. you talk about that with the, the strikeout, right? So what, you know, what, how does that relate to the strikeout market to a person? When you're selling a product, you're selling it to everybody. So here, like right now, I'm drinking a Virgil's. You ever had a Virgil's? No, soda, what is it, Jeremy? No, never. Have you ever had Zevia? Yes. All right. So this is like a Zevia, but okay. it's like it's like a gourmet Z. I mean, it's just like a gourmet Zevia. Okay. It's, it's like foamy and it's just it's like lux luxury in your mouth. You got to try it. And uh, so, Jeremy, why do you drink Zevia? Well, um, it's healthier. You know, it's obviously got no sugar. Because it has no sugar, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, and do you drink diet soda? Do you drink things with aspartame? Yeah, you don't, right? Yeah, but you'll no. drink, a, but you'll drink a stevia sweetened soda. Yeah. Right, so this, now we have a very clear person. I don't know if you consider yourself a low carb or, or keto or any of that, but you, but you. More low carb, yeah. And, okay, cool. So you're a low carb person who doesn't eat a lot of sugar and likes kombucha, doesn't... low carb person. I'm so a very now we've weird... got a yeah, very exactly. clear person, and guess what? I'm that person too, and I drink Zevia and Virgils, right? So it is just easier and more profitable to market your products to people rather than and look. I mean, I'm saying Virgils, and you're like, oh, I got to try it, right? I just yeah. told you about it, and you're like, oh yeah, got to try it. If I were to say to my grandparents who love Coca-Cola, <laughs> you got to try the sugar-free Virgils. They don't care. Yeah, They do not care. Right? And so it, even if Warren Buffett, who loves Coca-Cola, I'm like, yeah, but Virgils is sugar-free. He's like, 
not your guy. So I can have the best sugar-free soda in the whole wide world if I'm selling it to Warren Buffett. He doesn't really care. And so it is all about the person that you are selling to. And it, it, then it, it much more about that than it is about the product. Sometimes it is not that your product sucks and it's not that you suck. It's just that you're marketing it to the wrong person. And that flips everything. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder and so is value. Value is in the eye of the beholder too. Ryan, you know, you're a busy guy building companies, brands. Why did you decide to even write the book? I couldn't not. Um, <laughs> um, you know, Jeremy, I, everybody has their version of freedom. And mine is being able to deliver a message unencumbered. It's, it's saying what you believe yeah. regardless of the consequences. Yes. And you and I are sitting here. This is election day. I, I was just going to bring up, you've offended a lot of people. I, I you know. Know, Some very fine people on both sides. Yeah. Uh, and the book is one way for me to com just ex express what needs to be said in the way that I want to it, say it. How do you handle, you take a lot of flack. You, you do speak your opinions on business, politics, religion. Um, yeah. So... One, uh, I don't know, you know, it's election day, so it's appropriate to talk about that. But um, how do you take in the criticism? You know, it, I don't know. I don't know if I could take that amount of criticism that you take. Honestly. You know, it, it's, in, it's interesting because I don't notice it as much as other people do. But then when you say it back to me, I'm like, I guess I really do. I guess I do talk about politics and religion a lot. And I guess these are hot button topics for people. I do get a lot of flack <laughs> from, people, from, from people about this. Now, now that you mention it. There, I mean, there's one example. Uh, one every once in a while, it'll get to me. I did a response video to Andrew Yang's appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast. Okay, which, which, um, I did a, this video response to it, and I mean, hundreds of hateful comments. I mean, hun hundreds. Why? Of just, um, because I, because I I didn't think that Andrew Yang was honest in the interview with Joe Rogan. Um, I thought that he was he. His facts were incorrect and that he was stretching the truth in order to make a point. And so I just got hundreds of hateful comments from the online Yang gang. I got, I got nothing against Andrew Yang, but I have had a lot against what he had to say. That one kept me up for a few hours, right? It was just an onslaught of, of people wishing things upon me. When you and made the you... video, what, what were you thinking the reaction was going to be? Or, or you don't um, even care what the reaction is going to be. You just I, wanted to speak your mind. Correct. Correct. I don't care what the reactions are going to be. There, There is... If, if The minute that you're playing for reactions, you've lost. Because now you've given your power to the peanut gallery. Rather than decided to say what you feel needs to be said. This is why social media is an echo chamber. Because we cater to what other people say rather than just and or care about what people say rather than just owning what it is that you feel needs to be said like you don't have to respond to all the comments i don't you don't have to reply to all the haters i don't sometimes it's fun <laughs> <laughs> but i made my point in if i, I my, my my superpower is communicating I can say a lot of things in very few words and I put my intent in the post or the video or the podcast, the comments that are made to engage you. I already said my piece and, and you could be out at that point. So when you are playing for the responses, I think you have, yeah. you have already lost. I think, you know, Ryan, one of, one of my interviews, I think is the most commented on interviews was my Perry Marshall interview that I did about evolution 2.0 and I have a story for you about that. Yeah. I, I want to hear about it. And you know, does God exist? Frankly, the conversation going into the conversation, usually I talk about business. Um, I was uncomfortable doing the interview talking about the topic. Um, it was fine, but the talking about the topic makes me uncomfortable for whatever reason. And you chimed in in the comments and you have some interesting views um, also because you were set out to be a pastor. I so was, anyways, yeah. what's the story about, I would do want to, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, asterisks, I like Perry 
I, I don't think Perry could pick me out of a crowd, but I saw that interview that you did with Perry and invited him on my podcast to, uh, to, to have a go. And it was such, such a bad interview. He actually could, went on that. I could that. I, yeah. And, but, but I couldn't post it. It was, it was, I was like, I, I don't was, remember seeing it. Yeah. Right. I didn't post it. It was just, it was, and he was like, Oh, you can post it. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay being controversial. And I'm like, it wasn't the controversy. It was just, it was, uh, I like Perry and I like his message and I like what he stands for, but it was, but, uh, no, you inspired me to reach out to him as a result of, of that interview. But, but the interview was, what was it about? What would you have I mean, we, we talked about, this was five or six years ago. So yeah, yeah it was five years ago. Me, but, exactly. So, so, I mean, I mean, Perry's point, which I think is, uh, is that he sees evidence for the divine or evidence for God in science that he sees, he sees evidence for a divine for God in the makeup and the DNA of that is reflected in evolution. I, th I, th I think that's awesome. We can have a really nice philosophical conversation about that. But the minute that you try to make the other side, the enemy or like anti your view, I think that you kind of defeat your point. You, you lose the argument by setting it up as there's another side that disagrees with me and making the conversation about the other side. But if you can, you, you kind of can take the moral high ground by saying, yes, they are totally correct. And that gives me more evidence for the point that I believe, which is that there is divine fingerprints in science. I think that overall point is a, a beautiful point and, and worthwhile to discuss but I, I I don't like when it is made as there is a right team and a wrong team and we are just debating each other. So your journey as a pastor, why did you set out on that journey to begin with? Because even from a young age, even in the book, you talk about, I want to make a lot of money. I want to be a millionaire. Yeah. But you still went on the pastor route. Yeah, that was, that was a time of conflict in my journey for sure. Um, well, when I was in high school... I, I really got my comfort and my solace from the church and end up being like president of the youth group. If that means anything, uh, you know, I was, I was a, a leader of, of, of my, uh, of my youth group. And that was where I got a lot of meaning and purpose. And I mean, if you look at kind of what I'm good at, I'm good at communicating and making complex ideas simple. And I'm usually the leader in the room. And when you're in a church setting, that means it, it kind of becomes natural for you to pursue something like a pastoral route. There, but there was definitely some uh, semblances of of wanting to make God happy in that journey as well. Mm. And I remember going into orientation at my university and hearing somebody in the admissions office said saying that they were declared entrepreneurship, and I envied them. And it was, I remember it so distinctly because I was in there like punching my ticket for pastor and I hear somebody say they're studying entrepreneurship and I was like, oh, why not me? <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of the first indication of maybe I really want something else and that I'm stifling that out of some other indication in that case, it being guilt or desire for significance or or something else. What made you stop then the the pastor journey? I had a really good piece of advice given to me from one of my professors. And I, I share this in the book. I give this to aspiring entrepreneurs, the same piece of advice. And that piece of advice that she gave me was, if you can do anything else besides being a pastor and still be happy, please go do that other thing because there is nothing that will require a more commitment and sacrifice than being a pastor. So if there's anything else you can do, go do that thing. And for me, I was like, I'm going to go be an entrepreneur. And I say that to on aspiring entrepreneurs. Now, if what there's you, anything yeah. else <laughs> that you can do right, and still be happy, Go do that thing. Yeah. Because it will expose all of your cracks. And most people aren't ready for that. How have your views on religion changed from 
your journey mm-hmm. as a pastor to now? There's a logical progression or an emotional progression that most people like me go through where there is, so so I don't consider myself religious at, at all anymore. And the progression that I went through that I think a lot of people go through is that there is like the peak where you're all in, then the questioning. And you can decide what to do with that questioning. Some people fill it in with very weird beliefs to cover up the exposure. And some people will work through that. And and people like me end up saying, I'm out. And for me, it was very black and white because the church that I came from was basically saying that if you don't accept all of it, you don't get any of it. And I said, well, I don't accept all of it. So I guess that means I'm out. And so the natural or logical reaction to that is to be angry, to be an angry atheist, to thumb your nose at the church, call it evil, call it broken, call those people stupid, and go through your angry agnostic atheist phase or stage. And then if you're open to it, then there is this wide open field where you can say, well, now that... I'm okay questioning everything. I'm also okay exploring everything. And now I can take this piece and play with this and work this in and massage this in and sprinkle a little of that in and decide for yourself what you believe to be true, what 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 you believe to be the the nature of reality. And if you're willing to do that very hard work of not having the playbook given to you, then man, it's a beautiful exploration of this world and why we're here. And so my, what, where I have come to now is that I don't believe in any specific religion, but if you give me a topic, you know, we could probably, I can debate the Christians and I can debate the atheists and have a good time in either direction. Mm-hmm. You know, Ryan, there's a part of the book um, that I need closure on and <laughs> that I, I didn't believe it when I read it, okay? And it's, it's the part about one of your supposed best friends. Ah, and... Nice when you approached him when he was saying things about you. I mean, that that part, I think about it and it still stings me. I can't imagine how much it stings you, but mm. I cannot believe when you confronted this person and what they said, okay? I just can't believe it. I want to call yes. that person right now to, to <laughs> see if this is true. But anyways, I want you to tell that story for a second um, yeah. briefly. <laughs> and yeah, go ahead. So... Um... I was like, story, no way. I was listening to the book. I'm like, no, that's not possible. I'm sorry. Now here, So here, here's the thing, Jeremy. It is 100% true as I remember it. Yeah. And I'm not saying you're lying. And I'm that, just but, telling but, you. No, know, you're saying, but yeah. that's the important phrase, as I remember it. Okay. So he has a different story based on how he remembers it. Right. So what Jeremy is referencing is that when I was in middle school, I don't know why and this is like my favorite part of the whole book. Is that like <laughs> demonic well, it, of me? Because, like, because I love that some part. part of you relates to this. Yeah, totally. It's, it's some yeah. some part of you has a reference point for a similar experience. And that is that I was, my parents were divorcing. I was uh, changing schools and my body was changing all at the same time. I'm 13 years old. Um, and, and I'm leaving the Christian school to go to the public school because my parents can afford to, my parents are split and they can't afford to send me to the Christian school anymore. My whole life is changing and I had one friend who I clung to, right? And I dressed like him and I followed him around and I even found this, oh, this is so embarrassing. I found this um, one photo of me in my like eighth grade yearbook where I'm with him and I'm with this crowd of people and everybody's got a big smile and they're like hands in the air. And I didn't smile because he never smiled in pictures. Mm. Right. So, I mean, I really modeled this person and suppressed myself to fit in with, and I mean, and, and he was kind to me. He introduced me to other people. We did after school activities together, 
but he was like the person that I looked up to. And, um, and then like one, one day I, after spending, you know, two years as friends, he like looked at me from across the table and I don't remember how it came up, but I, I think he's intro by saying, I find you really annoying. And I get that a lot, Ryan. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just said, I, I find you really annoying. And I was, and this opened up a conversation. I was like, what are you talking about? And, and he said something to the effect of, I'm really only friends with you because I feel sorry for you. And I never went back to the lunch table. Right? Like I, I hid in the computer lab for the rest of the school year. Like every lunch break, I didn't, like I didn't pack lunch. I just went, worked at the computer lab, told my friends that they needed my help in the computer lab. And like my, my, my whole like idea of social, my place in this, in the social world was broken totally. and I avoided him for years. Like, like we had a couple conversations. I never brought it up, but we, I mostly just avoided him. I mean, he had been to my house. We had, we had played poker together. Um, Bizarre. And, and, and we were, and that was it. But in se like senior year of high school, is towards the end of the school year, and I finally was like, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confront him. Like I want to ask him what the hell happened. And so I, I, we were a lot. We were in an after school program together, and there was nobody else left in the room. And I went up to him and I, was, and I said, uh, Can we talk about the day that you, that told me you didn't want to be friends and that you only felt sorry for me? And he's like, What are you talking about? And I brought it up, and he's like, I never said that. It's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I've avoided you for four years because of this. He's like, I, I don't remember this. I have no recollection of this. Sorry. Now, the interesting, I told you at the beginning that the story is 100% true as I remember it. He remembers something completely different. I have no idea how he remembers it. I don't know for certain if I remember it accurately. I remember the emotion. I remember the shirt I was wearing. I remember the look on his face. I remember exactly how I felt. I remember the fear I felt going back to the lunch table. I remember the resentment and anger that I carried around about this person for three years. And I hated that he won most likely to succeed and I got second place. I wanted to beat him so bad. I remember that feeling. I don't know for sure if I remember it accurately. And I don't know his version of it. So you said that you wanted... You wanted a I want closure around, around it. Yeah, I exactly. Closure. I mean, the closure is I have looked him up three dozen times and he has no Facebook, no social media. Can't find him anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, you asked a question, Ryan, though, Tim is like, well, didn't you notice that we just haven't been talking for four years? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we hung around every day and you asked him that question and you think he'd have a good, you know, if that were the case, if he didn't notice, like, it's just bizarre to me. But you know? but I yeah. it, I have no idea what was going on in his life. Yeah. Now here's totally. here's what I do know about him. I do know that he was an absolute overachiever workaholic and had very few friends. Was very closed. Um I know that he felt in the lime in the shadow of his very successful family. I I, I have no idea what his demons were. Right. No idea. I know that one day his became mine and I wore them for four years until I decided to let them go. Yeah. No, I love that story because it just, you don't know what's going on for someone else ever. Like someone could be ever. pissed at you, happy. And you know, you can't really, unfortunately, even if it's a happy thing, like can't take it personally. That's right. right? And this is, this is why it makes no sense to make your decisions or your evaluations based on what other people do or say, because you have no idea what's going on with them. Most of us don't even know what's going on within ourselves. We don't even really know what's driving us. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the people close to us, you don't know what's going on with them. And certainly whoever responds to you on the internet, you don't know what's going on with them. Yeah. And when you get that, you can be humble about it and you cannot take things not so seriously and not so personally. You know, so when I was listening to the story in the book, right, and I was thinking the path was going to take a totally different turn. I was mm. thinking, this is the person we ended up starting a business together. This is who <laughs> I sold the, the company with. That's where I thought the story was going. Obviously, it went the opposite direction. So yeah. he, here's, here is the conclusion to all of this. 
Um, I was journaling about this in a, in a room with some friends of mine. And, uh, we were having like, you know, one of those moments we were all, I, I think we, we were at, we we're actually at an event and, uh, one of the speakers kind of unearthed some stuff by being vulnerable and sharing his story. It was Aubrey Marcus actually kind of shared a really vulnerable story and it forced me to go really internal. And I was talking about this with my friends and, um, I shared that story for the first time. Mm. And I said, I said to them, I was like, I didn't know that I was still carrying this, but some part of me, I think is still looking for the approval of that kid at the lunch table because I, I remember he was really into fitness and now I'm really into fitness. He was really into business and now I'm really into business. And I feel like part of me is still trying to beat that kid who hurt me at the lunch table. Mm. And, and I, and I cried and they all listened and were very kind. And, um, you know, one, one of the person that I was sitting next to, I knew through my business and the other two people I had, um, a, a relationship that resulted from me moving to Austin, Texas several years later. And I was kind of able to kind of connect all the dots back to that moment at the lunch table of like, because of that moment at the lunch table, I went here and did this and acted in this way. It was this, it affected everything. And I looked at my friends after talking about this for a good hour. And I was like, Oh my goodness, this moment is brought to you by that person's name, which is sort of a thank God moment. Yeah. I was like, I would have never known you had it not been for this person. I would not be coming to this realization. Had it not been for this deep wound, I would never have moved to Austin or did this thing or started this thing. And now I'm not saying like that I'm carrying this around and I'm making decisions from this place, but it's, becomes part of your personality those deep wounds drive the decisions that you stack on top of one another for years or decades of our lives and had it not been for that moment in mine i would have not had this beautiful journey that led me to that moment and meeting those individuals yeah and so it was at that for the first time i got to be grateful and i truly was grateful to this person for being the role that he was in my life and now I have no animosity. You know, I have no, I have no regret or hatred or any, like if I saw him, I give him a big old hug. There's, there is, there's total acceptance and healing around that because I realized that all the things that I've collected along my journey were partly because of exactly that moment. Yeah. Oh, I've totally, I've had friends where one comment, I'm sure the person doesn't remember, like, Oh, you're so weak. And then that person becomes like a super athlete and works out every day just because of one person in high right. school made a comment. Right. And that person right. doesn't even remember they made the comment. Right. I'm sure. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, we talk about modeling. Okay. You know, you were modeling that person at the time. Now you've chose different people to model, probably better decisions. Um, <laughs> I hope so. So talk about uh, Capcom for a second. Hopefully it comes back when events come back. Who have you considered to be the best speaker or maybe top two best speakers at Capcom? And, and you've had some amazing relationships because of the, the speakers that you've gotten to know. You know, it's so cliche for me to say Gary Vaynerchuk, but there's a, a reason why. So our first capitalism conference was in 2014 or 15. I think it was, I think it was 2014. And Gary V was kind of just at his rise. You know, he was just really starting to become popular. He was still wasn't you know the Gary V we know today, but he was on on his rise, and he was really known for Hustle Gary back then. And he was our keynote of the first day, and he snuck in the back door, had no entourage with him, was in a hoodie, very calm, soft spoken humble, quiet, and present. And that shocked me. And when I introduced him on stage, he walked up and he looked at me in the eye, shook my hand as I was coming off stage, like we were the only two people in the room. He showed me sincere gratitude. And then he went on stage and was like, all right, you know, and was, and was character Gary. 
But that left such an impression on me on how present and grateful and humble he was at that time. Um, so he was the person who surprised me the most. The person that I have learned the most from throughout this process has been Brian Lee. Brian Lee, um, he gets embarrassed every time I tell him this, but Brian Lee taught me so much in the one hour that I had on stage with him that it was like a masterclass in how real business gets done. And it was the first time that I saw someone operating from a place of what I would call true ownership rather than entrepreneurship. And Brian's model is to come up with the idea to raise the money, to hire the CEO and to get the hell out of the way. Say, call me when you need me. And that really inspired me to think a different game, think a different level. He said to me recently, we spoke uh, a few weeks ago and he said, my goal is to build billion dollar companies. If I only own 20% of a business, am I really going to be that upset? It's $200 million. Am I going to be upset that I gave up 80%? Because I couldn't have done it without all these other assets. So his, his goal is to build a company not to control the pie. And that's why he wins. And he built LegalZoom. He built Shoe Dazzle. He built The Honest Company. He built Art of Sport. He was the first investor behind Honey, the app that sold $4 billion to PayPal. He's got $4 billion companies on his resume. <laughs> Not too and, shabby. And he's like 50 years old. So watching how he actually does business changed the way that I think about things. And I think saved me 10 years and put me on a different path. So I learned the most from watching Brian. Yeah. And also, I mean, Gary V and you have some parallels with him winding on the Jets, you went on the Cleveland Indians. Right. Um, is that still on your roadmap? Well, you're asking me at an interesting time because I've never been so uninterested in baseball because there's no fans in stands and I just can't get myself to be interested. Um, I really do predict that contract values are going to come down. Revenues are coming way down in baseball. Um, and so I'm kind of interested to watch where the market goes. If there's a resurgence of interest in baseball, awesome, I'm in. And if there's no interest in baseball and the price comes way down, okay, I'm still in. But um, I'm not interested in owning a boring baseball team or a boring sport. And I think that the the sport overall is playing for... 1995 or 2005 rather than 2021 and beyond. And so um, I'll have to see how things shake out. Yes, it's still my North Star of how I'm organizing my life, but um, the, the sport isn't very exciting right now. Well, I, I think you have some really interesting ideas around VR. I, I want you to own the you Indians just to bring VR to the MLB. I think it's well, genius. I'm glad, I'm glad you saw that. Thank you. Uh, so what Jeremy's referencing is I think it's absolutely inevitable that we'll be watching baseball and maybe VR. you shouldn't share this Ryan, because like <laughs> then you could get the Indians implement all the VR in the Indians and across the MLB and every sport and you'll be good to go. Well, you know? I reached out to the team a yeah. couple of times and was like, I, I think that there are some things that you could do to save the fan base. And one of them being that we have all the technology to watch a game in VR and pick your seat. One of them being the catcher's mitt, you know, and watch the pitch, watch it from the batter's view. Totally. And I and love it. You, most people would rather do that than go to a game or watch it on TV. 100%. So I think that that is uh, how it is going to have to play out if, if teams are going to end up staying relevant. Because the, I, I really believe the days of being around 50,000 people at a time are, I don't know that they're ever coming back. Yeah. No, I, I um, made my daughter last night for 40 minutes. We were watching VR videos on headsets because I'm like, what you said is like, that is genius. Like we need people, I need to start learning that technology and like buying a headset just to, just to see what's going on. Cause that could mm. be the future, especially in the virtual world. Right. I mean, yes. yes. What, I mean, how do you think that's going to change? Have you, have well, you explored that at all more in depth? Yeah, I mean, this morning I was riding my Peloton and um, my daughter came in the room. It was, it was like 
six forty five, seven a.m. and my my daughter wakes up. I'm riding my Peloton, and uh, my daughter comes up and she's like. She, she had never seen me ride the Peloton. I just moved it from the basement into the living room. So she had never seen me riding it before. And her eyes light up because there's this big, bright screen. And I had two thoughts immediately. One of them was, my daughter is immersed by a screen. My li- <laughs> Like, my life is over. <laughs> and then my second thought is, the hell am I doing right now? Like, what the hell do I think I'm doing? I'm immersed in the screen watching my fitness instructor tell me how to ride the damn bike. So it was like, a, ah, I don't think this is going away. You know, like we all try to l- talk about limiting screen time and how it's bad for us. Like it's, we're only going to get more screens. Now you go to the gym on a screen. You know, now you, now when I have face-to-face conversations on a screen, right? It is absolutely inevitable that we're going to be having headsets on for most of the day. Maybe all of the day. I think it is, you play this out further, I think it's kind of inevitable that there will be people that live their life in the cloud, that live their life in VR. And I don't mean like spend all their time playing video games. I mean you start VR businesses. I mean you have, I mean you've got a relationship with somebody that you have only met in VR. I mean that you have a digital child with that you can only take care of when you've got the VR set on. <laughs> the thought is, is hilarious, yeah. But but play but play this out, it's kind of inevitable. I mean, we thought online dating was weird. Totally. Now there are people who have full on relationships, long distance or not, all digitally. It's only a matter of time that they could become they could be fully virtual. Businesses are virtual. Relationships will be virtual until I, I, I mean, I'm now talking hundreds of years into the future, but I, I think that what Elon is doing with, uh, the name escapes me, the, um, the hyperloop. Yes. Or... No, not hyperloop. Oh. Um, um, is, I think it's hyperlink. Okay. Hyperloop was the, the train, but hyperlink is like the implant where you can save memories and stuff. I mean, I think these are just signs of things to come. Right. Uh, Ryan, I have one last question, and I just want to thank you. Thanks for sharing, you know, always sharing on line on capitalism.com, on your podcast. Everyone should check out um, capitalism.com. They could check out and, and purchase 12 months to $1 million, um, and eventually when the conference uh, comes back as well. You know, I just wanted you to talk about the 1%, um, okay. and there was an 18-year-old kid in the 1%, and, and anything else – if I haven't talked about how else people can engage with you, whether it's the podcast, the book, your, you know, your site. Um, but I would love for you to talk about the 1%, what that is, but if there's any other places people should engage with you, you know, please mention it. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I mean the most accessible way to immerse yourself in my work or my methodology is my book called 12 months to 1 million. Um, and my podcast is, is called capitalism.com. My website's capitalism.com. And there, there is this kid that I have kind of an affinity for. He's this very young 18-year-old kid who was wrestling with this pain point of sharing his idea and sharing his business publicly, which I get so often from young entrepreneurs who, are, who say, I'm afraid to share my idea. What if somebody steals it? And I'm like, you don't think that – you think I have so much free time that I'm just going to steal your idea and do it. Like ideas are plentiful. I've got lots of ideas, lots of ideas. Most of them will never happen. So they aren't worth anything. And after a few weeks of kind of wrestling with this, I encouraged him to take the deck that he had put together and put it publicly on his own Facebook page. And the encouragement and the outreach that he got from that was like, that's when that kid was in. Like that's when he was like, it was an idea in my brain that I felt weird talking about. Now I get that other people want to be a part of this. Other people want to invest in it and I'm all in. In fact, one of the first things that we do with some of our, our higher end students is we walk them through putting together a pitch deck so that their idea is really clear. And then we get them to share it publicly somewhere. Because what happens is when you talk about what's inside of you and you bring it to the forefront, other people who vibe with that, 
start to reach out and offer where they can be of, be of help, whether it is money, like with me, I offer to invest in companies. There are people who have audiences who offer to share it with their companies. This woman that you have pulled up on the screen right now, Adama, Adama has influencers that offer to share her work, right? So we, we, I have so many entrepreneurs who struggle with this idea of sharing their ideas publicly. And when, as soon as I can get them to do that and they see how much support they have in the world, their, their, their life changes. And that story of that 18 year old kid is, is one of my favorite examples of that. What is the 1%? The 1% is my mentorship program for entrepreneurs who are building businesses and investing the profits. Everyone, Ryan, first of all, thank you. Everyone check out capitalism.com. Everything is there. Check out the podcast. Check out the book. Ryan, I'll be the first one. Thank you so much. Jeremy, you're a phenomenal interviewer. Thank you so much for thank having you. me. Thank you. Really Appreciate it. this. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 